right here on this peaceful river is where the story starts of a sea voyage that took us halfway around the world. A wartime sea voyage. Yep, it's the Mississippi. Old Man River himself. Sort of makes you homesick, doesn't it? Homesick for when you were a kid in the good old summertime, when you listened for the steamboat blowing for the bend. <laughs> Remember your first ride on a stern wheeler with her paddles biting into Mississippi water? And thinking maybe how you'd like to run away down the river on one of them to St. Louis or Memphis or maybe even New Orleans, then aboard a big ship out to sea? Well, that happened to me. It's a long jump from the middle of America to the deck of a seagoing freighter. But that's how I happen to know about this voyage that started right here in the town of Hannibal, Missouri, the hometown that Mark Twain made famous. It would have tickled old Mark, I bet, to have been with us. He liked to tell about big things happening, and they happened big to us, all right. He was a great traveler, too. And wherever he went, he brought his America, the real America of Hannibal, Missouri, along with him. And we did, too. We had the kind of adventures Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer dreamt about. There they are, looking out across the big river. Real American kids. The town of Hannibal has changed since those days, I guess. Paved streets and automobiles and so forth. The people haven't changed. When war came, they pitched into work and fight so that the American brand of freedom and liberty could survive. Like every other American town, Hannibal had sent its boys to the battlefronts and her men and women were helping to win the toughest war America had ever been in. Now, when I said the town of Hannibal was the starting point of a wartime sea voyage, here's what I meant. Somewhere in one of the battle zones, the United States Army needed a railroad. Railroads mean freight cars, and freight cars need wheels. Now, railroad people everywhere will tell you Hannibal is famous for making car wheels. So Hannibal's car wheels went to war, and the first lap of their journey was from here in Missouri to the shores of California. Here's what happened to Hannibal's wheels. Now, if the Army wanted a railroad, there was only one place for it to come from, the good old USA, and only one way to get it overseas, on ships of the United States Merchant Marine. So out here on the docks of San Francisco, we began to take aboard our ship car wheels for a railroad somewhere, we guessed, across the Pacific Ocean. This is early February, 1945. Lots of things are happening out there west of the Golden Gate. On shore, the newsboys are yelling that our troops have gone into Manila, that our Navy is plastering the Jap-held China coast, and our B-29s are stepping up the fire raids on the Nips home islands. So we were in a hurry to finish loading and get this cargo to where it was needed. The great port of San Francisco was naturally the jumping off place for most of the stuff moving west. We were just one of the hundreds of merchant ships taking war goods aboard. We were mighty proud of our brand new victory ship, and <laughs> look at her name. She was one of the bunch named after American towns, you remember? Nobody aboard hailed from Hannibal itself, but that didn't stop us from adopting Hannibal as our hometown. Now we began stacking our holds with freight car underframes. I guess you'd call them chassis. The stevedores and longshoremen wasted no time fitting them below deck. Their job was to speed up what they called turnaround time. In other words, hustle each ship out of port as fast as possible, because in war, it's the ship at sea, not at the dock, that counts. In the spaces between our bulky cargo, we packed small but badly needed stuff, such as K-rations, cots, 
hospital supplies like bandages and plasma, and dozens of other valuable items the boys overseas were hollering for. But this was the payoff cargo. Nothing less than eight full-grown railroad engines complete with tenders. Each engine weighed 55 tons, and its tender tipped the beam at 20 tons, complete with fuel oil. The idea was that these fellows would be ready to run as soon as we could set them down on rails somewhere in the Pacific. We were tied up to the dock where they had the biggest crane in the harbor, a 100-ton job. And the way that crane operator handled those babies, you'd have thought they were toy electric trains. But they weren't. They'd have dropped. Well, the Hannibal Victory never would have even sailed from Frisco. One of our mates told me afterwards this voyage gave him a bad dream. He dreamed he was that old Greek king. What's his name? Damocles, that's it. But instead of a sword always dangling over his head, it was a locomotive. But one by one, they were set into place on the deck on either side of each hatch. Four hatches, eight locomotives. Easy. Easy does it. Now the last one's down. We'd laid regular road beds, you might say, out of big pine timbers to cushion the weight of the locomotives on our steel deck plates. The wheel flanges fit those timbers just like rails. And to keep them from shifting in a heavy sea, we welded turnbuckle and steel rod assemblies to the deck and clamped them tight and wedged, chained, and bolted them down. We were getting near the end of the loading job now, and all hands knew that sailing day was near. Somebody else knew our time was short, too. The chief mate had only been married a little while, but it doesn't take a woman long to find out that a voyage is likely to be a long one. I can remember the chief saying, I'm going ashore on a couple of errands. When I get back, I want to see number one hatch secured. Well, we went ahead with the job and got the big tarps flashed into place. Rockadero was windy that day. I saw her red hair all ruffled up and him with that baseball cap he always wore. I wonder how many million times in history some girl has gone down to the water's edge to watch her seafaring man off for what might be, well, for the last time. Anyhow, we began lashing down the cargo booms, tried to wind up all the last details before sailing time. sailing time was a secret. But do you think it could be kept 100% secret from her? Maybe she didn't know the exact hour. Oh, well, all I can say is I'm, I'm glad nobody was there to tell me goodbye. Best thing is to keep busy up to the last minute. You don't have any brass bands on the dockside when you sail in wartime. We practically sneaked away that cold February morning. But it takes a while to get out of San Francisco Bay. And if you've never done it, well, that's an experience. You watch the other ships, the great city built on hills slip by like on a movie screen. With our cargo out on deck sticking up like a sore thumb, we had a feeling everybody on shore was looking at us. The Bay Bridge is ahead. There's a hospital ship in from the Pacific. And that's a P-2, a big new type passenger ship converted to carry troops when war broke out. And those bridges. We had two army corporals aboard, nursemaids for the locomotives. And that's Sparks, our radio operator, with the Army Security Officer. 
they've sighted the Golden Gate Bridge ahead. Now we've been led through the submarine net from the Navy's our signals. The pilots on the flying bridge with the skipper. The talker is checking his telephone. He's hooked up to each of the gun stations. That's Peg Leg and Joe on the engine. Funny how we got attached to those locos. The engines, I mean, not the guys. Now the Golden Gate's astern, and there's the pilot boat laying to to pick up our pilot. Now we know we're on our own. Dropping the pilot always makes you feel like you've cast off your last line to shore. The engineer opens the main throttle. The turbine starts turning smoothly. Starts spinning the big shaft which links up our 6,500 horsepower turbines to the propeller. It's gaining speed. Now you begin to feel the lift of the Pacific. This is what a ship is built for. I guess this is why a fellow goes to sea. So we're headed west. 10,000 tons of steel cargo in our holds and lashed to the deck, banging through the blue Pacific. The fast victory ship was the answer out here, all right. There's lots of ocean and time is short. We tried out our guns right away so we could turn back if anything was wrong with them. We're out at sea now and anything can happen. It's the first morning out. Sun peeped through just enough for the skipper to get our position. You got to admire the captain. He's already had two ships shot out from under him, but he's kept sailing, even though he wasn't getting any younger. Now he'd opened his sealed orders and was plotting our course for the navigation officer to follow. We were headed for Gaete, which was an army code word for a certain point of longitude and latitude. As far as we were concerned, it was destination unknown. As we steamed westward, the scuttle butt began. These seagoing rumors had us leading the invasion of the Chinese mainland, had us headed for the Philippines, for India, for Japan itself. But most of us had learned to discount this kind of talk and just to wait and see. So we settled down to shipboard routine. We're on our maiden voyage, but the maintenance starts right away. You gotta like one thing if you go to sea and that is to paint. Anyhow, it's a fine job for the young fellas. Sort of reminded us of Tom Sawyer, how he got the boys not only to whitewash his fence, but to pay for the privilege, remember? We told these lads it was good experience. You know, on this trip, half our deck crew were making their first voyage. They'd been through the government's maritime training schools, but they still had a lot to learn. Board ship is always something to be lifted or lowered or moved from here to over there. The block and tackle is the answer. In landlubber language, that's a pulley and a rope. And a faulty block might cause a mean accident. If you're not painting, then you're chipping away old paint, or so it seems. There was one routine job nobody ever tried to get out of. Keeping the lifeboat gear in first class shape. When you need a lifeboat, you need it in a hurry. That's Peg Lake going aloft. 
It seems like he wanted all the tough jobs just because he did have only one real leg. The other was aluminum. You see, Peg had been in the Navy and around Guadalcanal somewhere, they got his ship. When he came to in the hospital, he owned one less leg. But that didn't stop him. Somehow or other, after he learned to use his shiny new leg, he still wanted to go to sea. So there he was. More of a man than any of us, we thought. In peacetime, you can tell what company operates a merchant ship by the colors on her stack. But in war, it was gray and black. This is a job for a man who knows how. And Maxie the bosun knew how. You gotta have tough hands for this. He's making a splice and wire rope. Maybe the day of the sailing ship is gone forever, but there's still a couple of miles of rigging strung around on a modern cargo ship. And practically all of it is steel wire rope, strong enough to lift several tons. So a modern sailor has got to know the special tricks of handling it. There's a splice, strong as the line itself. The rigging aloft has to be kept sluiced down with tallow and graphite so it won't rust and jam. And so the seagoing housekeeping went on. All the small jobs it takes to keep a ship sailing, no matter whether it's wartime or peace. Red was an ex-football player, but another of our lads very new to the seafaring profession. One day he came aft during his off watch to catch some air. So you get paid to watch a goonie bird, hey, Maxie asks? Maybe you're learning to fly to be a pilot, hey? Oh, says Red, I only came here on the back end to rest up a little. On the what? He Maxie yells. You and me are gonna go on a little tour. And he lectures as he goes. Mainmast. Cargo booms. That's number four hatch. On the bridge deck, Maxi stops. Okay, is that the stack or the funnel? Red says, gee, Bolson, I don't know. Maxi says, I don't know either. They make their way forward until they get to the flying bridge. This is on top of the wheelhouse and has a duplicate set of controls. Did they tell you what this was at school, Maxie asked? That's right, the wheel. And this? Correct, the binnacle. Now Red says, Bolson, I'll show you a thing or two. Lifeboat. Bulkhead, not wall. Porthole, not window. Deck, not floor. Foremast, cross tree, ventilator. Hatch. Cargo boom. Anchor windlass. Now they're all the way forward. Red pats the bulwark. The front end, he says. The what? Oh, Boatswain, I'm sorry, I mean the bow. But Maxie's through. Be sorry below. Scram. This was another and very important routine job on the voyage, taking care of the locomotives. Those two GIs groomed those engines like they were prize racehorses. They spent practically all their waking hours spraying the engines with a gooey mixture of paint and oil which wouldn't dry out and greasing and oiling every moving part. Otherwise, the rust would have ruined them sitting out here in the salt spray. Funny thing about the two GIs, they'd been working for a railroad before they got in the Army and now here they were doing the same thing as they did in peacetime.
days went by in a hurry as we knifed westward through pleasant seas. The Pacific was living up to its name so far. I remember our first Sunday on that voyage. From the after gun deck came the sounds of singing. Hymns, it was. It was the Navy gun crew going to church in the sunlight, holding their Sunday services in the shadow of their own guns. It was a fine, full sound out in the clean air. The chief mate happened to be making his rounds because Sunday or not, we were a cargo ship underway, and besides, they were waiting for us somewhere on the far side of the Pacific to deliver those locomotives in good shape. Now, church services are part of Navy custom, but in his own quiet way, the chief mate joined in, too. And all the while, the lookout scanned the face of the waters, kept watch upon the heavens. That was a Sunday, we had a strange visitor. Here we were, 500 miles from any known land, and this long-legged fellow comes aboard. Somebody said he must be a Jap spy, so we caught him. Even a spy gets hungry, we thought, but he was here on business. Wouldn't have chow with us. We gave him a lift, but what we didn't realize was he had business to attend to. Then we got it. He came aboard to inspect us. And with his hands behind his back in his white frock coat, he carefully checked over each turnbuckle and ring bolt, saw to it that our cargo was lashed down ship shape in Bristol fashion. And pretty soon he went back somewhere to make his report. Sunday was a good day for a lot of little personal jobs. We took turns cutting each other's hair, and some of the lads did a good job at it, too. Lots of advice from the customer. Also, you had a little time to repair your sea bag, for instance, with expert assistance, of course. Ever see a good ship without a monkey aboard? It was on Sunday you felt domestic turn to on some of your old household chores. The old timers knew how to take care of their own little problems like this. Maybe that's why so few sailors get married. They figure they can handle this department by themselves. Each man develops his own technique, you might say. Sunday was the day the boys in the stewards department showed off. What bread those guys baked. We all agreed that the Hannibal Victory fed well. And a well-fed ship is a happy ship, as any sailor knows. Pies makes my mouth water to think of them. The baker was as proud of his pies as mother used to be. Nobody would believe he hadn't ever had any experience before he signed up, but he swore that was the truth. So I guess he just had natural talent. Baker was a friendly guy, so maybe he didn't care if it was dangerous to leave any slices hanging around convenient-like. Watch out. One of the rules aboard 
aboard our ship was that every man must have plenty to eat. The steward's department totaled about a dozen cooks, bakers, and messmen all told. Their job was to feed 80 hungry men. This meant serving six meals per day to take care of the men on the different watches, with coffee and sandwiches on hand any hour of the night or day. Food was first class, too. The war shipping people arranged it so every merchant ship could draw on stockpiles of hard-to-get provisions like meat, poultry, butter, eggs, and so forth. We carried our own refrigeration, of course, so we kept our food good and fresh and had a lot of menus so that nobody suffered from not getting all the vitamins or whatever it was they needed. No cover charge and a free floor show. Compliments of Tokyo Rose. The Japs had been smart enough to realize how much those phony broadcasts tickled us. They'd have cut them off the air. So officers and men sitting down to the same good chow, we had our Sunday dinner steaming along on a fair run through the mid-Pacific. Nobody seemed to have a care in the world. But you couldn't keep the engineers from talking shop. Revolutions, steam pressures, arguing the merits of turbines compared to the up and down engines and the liberties, and so on and on. Well, a good meal calls for a good cigar. Our Navy lieutenant was an ex-football coach, by the way. Even the skipper loosened up after Sunday chow. We were wondering then how long and how bloody the road to Tokyo would be. The thing that you noticed about the armed guard crew was how young they were. Those were the kids who used to hang around the corner drugstore when school was out. They were filing clerks, machinists, helpers, farmers' sons. These were the soft, spoiled Americans who didn't stand a chance against the trained armies of Hitler, Mussolini, and Hirohito. With Chow over, those of us off watch were swapping lies or otherwise showing off our seafaring ability. That's Sully, the Hawaiian Irishman, showing what he learned in maritime school. He's another of the bunch we had aboard from the island. Joe was an ex-fisherman from Monterey. When war came along, he figured he could serve best in the merchant marine. And we agreed. Don't let the beard fool you, this was Tony's first voyage. But of course, the real expert on nautical matters was red, as usual. Weedy needed was a grass skirt. Then the old maestro shows how a fancy one is done. To one pair of lads aboard ship, Sunday wasn't entirely a day of rest. Our two cadet midshipmen had to finish a certain amount of studying by the time they reported back in the States. They couldn't help being a little homesick around the edges now and then. They were good kids and we're going to make good officers. Sunday was the traditional day for riding home. The mate was pretty good about it, but some of the rest of us just put it off, I guess. Put it off so long, we didn't have anybody to write to. 